Hey there, Comics Alliance fans. This is Matt Wilson back once again to introduce another clip from the podcast I co-host with Chris Sims, War Rocket Ajax here at ComicsAlliance.com. This week, Chris and I are reviewing some of the comics of the week. We're going to be talking about Batman number 30, the first part in the last act of Zero Year. We're going to be talking about Superior Spider-Man number 31, the final issue of that series. And we're going to be talking about Oni Press's The Auteur number 2. Check out all three of these reviews in just a moment. If you want to hear the full episode of War Rocket Ajax, go to warrocketajax.com on Monday or go to iTunes. That's where you'll find the full episode where, in addition to those, these comics reviews, we'll be talking to the writer and artist behind the new series Flash Gordon from Dynamite, Jeff Parker and Evan Doc Shaner. And uh, we'll be doing, doing a lot of other fun stuff that we do on the show as well. But for now, enjoy this clip from War Rocket Ajax. Let's start off talking about Batman number 30. Oh, do you, this is how you want to start off? You want to start off with me flipping right out on you? Sure. This comic rules. It is amazing. This is legit my favorite issue of Batman since R.I.P., which is probably my second favorite Batman story of all time. If you've been paying attention to Comics Alliance, you know that I've, I'm have i a big fan of Zero Year, and you've heard us talk about that even right here on the show. This issue is everything I love in comics, in superhero comics. It's a Batman story where Batman is fighting the Riddler. But the Riddler has basically turned Gotham City into a combination of No Man's Land and Murder World. <laughs> he has city-sized death traps that Batman has to solve riddles to get out of. It is my favorite thing in the world. It is a very clear rejection of that call for realism in our superhero comics, I feel. Oh, it's it really is. Because it, what I love about Zero Year. Because this is a comic where the Riddler establishes very clear rules for how he can be beaten. He does not believe that anyone can come up with a riddle that he can't solve. And there's a great scene in this issue where a businessman challenges the Riddler with a riddle, and before he can get half, like, a f more than a few words into the riddle, the Riddler knows the answer. And explains how he knows, even though the guy made the riddle up on his own. Uh, it's It works really well. It's that Batman 66 kind of Riddler. You know, that classic Riddler who... You know, if you solve his riddles, he's he's beaten. He gets on his giant TV, and the big eye in the dot of the question mark opens up and looks at all the people of Gotham City. And he challenges them to the riddle contest. It's amazing. At one point, he knocks over buildings like dominoes. That's how, that's how realistic this comic is. And I love the way that Greg Capullo draws the Riddler giving his speech. Capullo, I think, has always had that really, really nice blend on Batman of kind of cartoonish exaggeration, but also really, you know, really solid, weighty figures. But when he's drawing the Riddler on the screen, kind of gloating and challenging, he skews more and more towards the cartoonish and exaggerated. It's more and more smooth lines, which I really, really love. Uh, also, there's killer robots in this comic. <laughs> Yes. It's everything I love. It is legit everything I love. Uh, now, we didn't mention Batman waking up in a kid's room in an apartment. <laughs> yes. Here's, here's my one issue with this issue. <laughs> it's the same complaint about anything that is a prequel. And that is, this, this particular issue goes to great lengths to put James Gordon in danger. But we know that nothing happens to James Gordon. You could argue that even in a, a comic set in current continuity, we know that nothing's going to happen to James Gordon, right? Yeah. But here we know that like, there's 
there has not been a mention of like, yes, we were all we all thought he died during zero year. So we know full well that like when the the building dominoes topple over, uh, there's going to be a way out of it. I I feel like that sort of necessarily undercuts the tension and suspense, but I think that's a failure of prequels in general, not just this story. I think you could say that. I think there's also that's also a point in its favor, though, because you know that obviously Batman doesn't die in this comic. Bruce Wayne is not permanently injured. Jim Gordon, in in a comic that came out this week, has two eyes, two arms, two legs, and a mustache, so we know he's okay. So what happens in the comic has to be entertaining all on its own. Right. And for me, the Riddler destroying Gotham City with poison ivy juice and then turning it into his Riddle Kingdom to accelerate social evolution (laughs) is delightful. I'd like to see a timeline of what actually took place. Because I never got a full sense of how long Batman was knocked out. I think, don't they say? They they say it was like since a certain thing happened. But it's not a, a fi- it's not a, like an actual period of time that he's told. Yeah. But, that, but clearly, true. clearly it's been a good long while for all this to have happened while he's well, been unconscious. Not necessarily, though, because one of the things that uh, I don't think is is really specifically explained in the comics as much as it is in me talking to Snyder about Zero Year for like five hours is that uh, all the crazy overgrowth in the city and the destruction of the city was done by the by Poison Ivy stuff. Like Riddler right. steals Poison Ivy stuff, and so like it could be it could be a week, you know. Yeah, it's not so much the overgrowth as like the weariness of the people and how the people are have almost become used to this new situation. Yeah. Like the kid knows what's going on well enough to explain it to Bruce Wayne. Yeah. The the businessman who tries to challenge the Riddler with a riddle has like a beard. He's like you know, disheveled. Jim Gordon actually look. Jim Gordon with a beard looks like you with a beard. By the way, <laughs> like I was, I was flipping through it just now, and I, I got to that. There's a panel where you see Jim Gordon with his full beard, and I'm like, wow, that really looks like Matt. I, I'll take that as a compliment. But I think that's you know part of the compressed time of comics. Uh, you mentioned when we had a conversation about it the other day that it, there's a lot of, uh, in the same way that there was a lot of Batman Begins. In the first act of Zero Year, there's a lot of Dark Knight Rises in this one with the crazy villains take over the city. Well, there's you know, there, are, there are bridges rigged up with bombs. Yeah, which also happens in No Man's Land. So it's right. all it's all circles. It's all circular logic. I, I do love that this brings to mind the the major studio movie where every cop in the city gets trapped underground <laughs> for yeah. six months. I think it also resembles. Dark Knight Rises just in terms of escalation. Dark Knight Rises was a movie that escalated that version of Batman's story. The stakes got so much higher in that movie. And the stakes are so much higher in this part of Zero Year as compared to the previous two parts. You know, because the first part was just Batman versus this gang. And then the second part was... Yes, there's a, a a hurricane, but a lot of that second part was sort of more fo- focused, and then this third part just blows the focus out hugely. It's it's risky in that way, I think, because because one of the big complaints about Dark Knight Rises, you know, is that it's over it overreached, and I, I don't think this does that yet. If it's if it's going to, I don't know, but. Um, it certainly expands the focus quite substantially. Yeah, I, I just think this is this is just crazy bonkers fun Batman stories. Yeah, and one of the things that Snyder talked about when I interviewed him uh, last week was that he he feels that this story, like the the Wild City or Savage City arc of Zero Year, is the payoff. Like, you got through all the other stuff, now it's time for things to get crazy and fun. And if the other stuff wasn't crazy and fun, 
then, you know, Batman, sh- sh- short sleeve Batman on his dirt bike is, yeah. uh, is going to do it. <laughs> I am so, like, oh man, I am, I am delighted by this. But uh, we, we do have to talk about a couple other comics, right? We should. One that I want to talk about is Superior Spider-Man number 31, which is the last issue of the Superior Spider-Man series. And really, if we want to get technical about it, I feel like this is kind of the first issue of the new Amazing Spider-Man series. Because this issue is pretty much all Peter. Doc Ock has more more or less disappeared into whatever recesses of Peter Parker's brain where he goes in the previous issue. Like, the way that issue 30 ends is Peter, and spoilers, if you're waiting for the trade or whatever, Peter basically comes back when Doc Ock allows him to. Um, Doc Ock more or less admits defeat because he has pretty much been completely beaten by the Green Goblin and his Goblin Nation. And Peter is kind of allowed to take over his body again. This issue is a lot of, like, Peter defeating the goblins, but also just telling everybody, hey, sorry I was acting so weird, I was Dr. Octopus. (laughs) (laughs) And part of the beauty of this book being so entrenched in the Marvel Universe is that most people just, like, take him right at his word. Like, he says to Mary Jane, yeah, I was Dr. Octopus. And uh, and Mary Jane is just like I believe you. It doesn't make it any better. The the only like interactions where he has to tiptoe around it a lot more are with Aunt May, who he can't say that to, with J. Jonah Jameson, who has J. Jonah Jameson probably gets the biggest surprise moment of the entire issue in a backup story, actually, <laughs> and also with. The character who was introduced specifically for Superior Spider-Man to be the Doc Ock version of Peter's girlfriend. Somebody who ends up being really hurt by Octavius Parker um, disappearing. So it's, it's, one of the, it's a Spider-Man story. It's like one of those stories where Peter wins, but he ends up hurting somebody and feeling terrible about it in the process even though it was a terrible thing for Dr. Octopus to have his body and be doing the things he was doing. I think Spectacular or Superior Spider-Man has been really nicely handled throughout. I liked this issue. Um, I think it's a tad rushed because it just feels like it's wrapping everything up. I think I I like the backup story a lot because it gives the character is more room to breathe and kind of discuss what's happening. There's also quite a bit that's set up with like where Norman Osborn's going, why Norman Osborn's been doing what he's doing, which is a little bit of a surprise. And, and it sets up more stuff for the amazing Spider-Man series to come. I was impressed. And the last issue that we're going to be talking about is the auteur number two from Oni press this is a crazy, crazy comic. <laughs> I, I don't think we have talked about the auteur on the show uh, before this, Chris. I, I don't even know how to describe it, really. Um, it is an extraordinarily violent comic. Yes, I mean, the, the cover for the first issue shows that. This issue, the second issue, uh, features very, very graphic art of a very brutal murder. And what happens after that is that the lead character of the comic, the movie producer Nathan T. Rex, who is, uh, has suffered from a terrible box office bomb, recruits this murderer to be in his movie and then defends him in court to get him, uh, like basically get him off or get a, a mistrial declared. And it is just farcical. It is so out there and so crazy. Um, it takes a while to get used to the tone of this book. And I should note that it's by Rick Spears and James Callahan. But I think once you get used to the very crazy, irreverent tone of the auteur, 
uh, it can become something really enjoyable as this like satire of like Hollywood, like desperate Hollywood people who will do whatever to make a name for themselves and recover from a failure. Like I get the feeling that Nathan T. Rex is like part Ed Wood. It feels like there's some design of him that's taken after John Waters. I don't know who else exactly he's supposed to be designed after. He is like this kind of character that is is fascinating in how amoral and immoral he can be, you know? Yeah. I'm I'm fascinated by this comic. It's I'm it's hard to say with like a big smile on my face and a thumbs up that I like it. But in that like trash cinema kind of way I do. I mean this is this is a comic where a few pages in a sorority girl is just brutally horribly murdered. And it's hard to say like I like that. <laughs> you 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 do have specific tastes. Uh. <laughs> yes. Uh but I also am a fan of the movie Street Trash. So that's how that goes. I think in a trash cinema kind of way this comic is really fascinating and enjoyable. I've got both issues, but I have not read them yet, so I really need to sit down with them. I know that the uh, the guys at Oni were really excited about it when I uh, talked to them up in Seattle. Uh, with good reason. It's a it's a good looking book. It's a it f- certainly feels like a comic that's designed to get people talking. I think it succeeds. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening to this clip from this week's episode of War Rocket Ajax a few days early. Again, if you want to listen to the full episode, go to WarRocketAjax.com on Monday or subscribe to War Rocket Ajax on iTunes. You'll hear our interview with Jeff Parker and Evan Doc Shaner. We're going to talk a lot about Flash Gordon. We'll do some entries to our Every Story Ever list, and we'll do some other fun stuff. Tune in then. Until then, everybody, thanks for listening.